you know, martial arts is, is a little microcosm of the world, like a dojo is like a little microcosm of the world. Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio with today's guest, Kyoshi John Payton. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. What does that mean? Well, if you want to know what that means, go to whistlekick.com. Check out everything going on over there. Sign up for our newsletter. Visit the store and use the code PODCAST15 to get yourself 15% off everything in there. That's one of the ways you can support all the work that we're doing. Now, of course, this show is one of the many things that we do. And if you want to support the show, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And by support, I mean, check us out. Have a visit. Sit down. Check out some episodes. Check out some transcripts or photos, videos, links, social media for the guests. All kinds of good stuff over there. We bring you two shows a week. And why do we do that? Well, we're trying to connect you and educate you and entertain you as a traditional martial artist. And if all this stuff that we do means something to you, yeah, you could make a purchase, but you could also, I don't know, follow us on social media. You could tell friends about an episode. You could pick up one of our books on Amazon, leave a review for the podcast or support our Patreon. If you think the new shows are worth a whopping 63 cents a piece, not to mention all the back episodes, then consider supporting us for a whopping $5 a month. Go to patreon.com slash whistlekick. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick and sign up. You can throw us a couple bucks a month and we'll even give you original exclusive content that you're not going to find anywhere else. I don't know that I've ever met today's guest, but we sure have a number of friends in common and I'll all but guarantee we were in some of the same places at the same time. Koshi John Payton spent years as a high-level competitive martial artist touring the world. And for many, that would be enough to hang their hat on and say, I've accomplished a lot. I've achieved a great martial arts life. But when he set down competition, that wasn't the end. He picked up something else. And it was a, a quest, a hunt for more. And on today's episode, we talk about not only that competitive side and the pretty incredible origin story that brought him into martial arts, but we talk about that second act and what that's led to and the shift in training and personality and attitude that it's yielded. It's a great story, a lot of fun. So here we go with Kyoshi John Payton. Yeah, I, um, I've listened to obviously a, a ton of the of, of your stuff and I, I well, really, you. really enjoy it. And I can't tell you how honored I am to, to be part of your group now. You know, I hope I can live up to expectations. There, there aren't any. <laughs> so you're good. You're good. <laughs> you know, me. it's it's funny. I was engaging with someone who posted a few comments on, on the YouTube channel yeah. overnight. And they, they said something about, they hope that maybe one day they'll live uh, the martial, a martial arts life that's, you know, prominent enough that they get invited on the show or something. And I was like, yeah. I, I think you're missing the point. That's not the point, right? Yeah. You know, the point is that we all have so much more in common. Yeah. Then than we have more that binds us than divides us. However Absolutely. you want to say that. Absolutely. Because, yeah. I mean, the only reason anybody knows who I am as a martial artist is because of this show. <laughs> Otherwise, I would just I would be your very run of the mill martial artist who just likes to train and hang out and yeah, you know, talk to other martial artists. Yeah, you know, just <laughs> yeah, just shooting the breeze about yeah. you know, what we do and why we do. And I, I think I think that because we have, let me say it a different way, we don't have quote unquote heroes the way most industries, hobbies, pursuits do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you grew up playing football, you have any number of people you can look at and say, yeah. "I want to be like that right. person." Right. We don't so much have that. Right. And so, I mean, I'm not going to be able to create that. I'm not that. <laughs> so instead, we're going a different angle, saying, "Hey, you're not alone." Yeah. Yeah. And everybody just seems to have it. You know, when I when I listen to all the different people, and I've you know I've heard of some of them, I'm friends with some of them, I'm you know close personal friends with some of them, and some of them I've never heard of before in my life. And then they go into their story, and you know some you know Vietnam vet marine who trained in Okinawa for thirty years. I'm like, holy crap, that guy's got an unbelievable story, right. you know. 
And it's just amazing that everybody, like you said, there's so much more commonality and everybody, everybody has a cool story, you know? (laughs) And and I think when you look at those stories, you see that because nobody's martial arts starting point is that different from anybody else. It's like some of the specifics might be. Yeah. But there are only a handful of reasons anybody starts training. Sure. The reasons they right. stick around might be different. Right, right. But the genesis is so similar right. that we start to see, oh, yeah. that person's not that different than me. They just made a yeah. few different choices in yeah. you know, yeah. what they trained or, or why they trained or yeah. you know, where they are. Yeah. What I really enjoyed from listening, um, you know, probably listen to 20 or 30 um, interviews with different people and, you know, some of the other subjects that you covered, um, but mostly just interviews with it, with individuals kind of telling their story. And it, it just, it just struck me that like, I, you just can relate to these people. Like they're just, they're just, re- like you said, they're just regular guys just going ahead, pursuing their martial arts career and, and doing their thing. And, and we're all, it's, it's like every single person I listened to, it was like, I was, they were talking to me. Because, yeah. you know, I had half, you know, half of this, what what they had exactly. going on. I had that going on also, you know? Yeah. 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 It's, I wonder where would we be as an industry and maybe even as, as a world, if instead of focusing on the differences, mm. you know, oh, that's not the right way to do that. Or, yeah. or you know, yeah. your rank is illegitimate because the person that promoted you didn't actually earn their belt from so and you know like though if we didn't focus on that crap yeah. and, and we uh, focused on the love of training mm. and the betterment that it brings to all of us where would we be yeah i'll tell you and and the and the, it's funny you, you say something like that i've always thought that you know martial arts is, is a little microcosm of the world like a dojo is like a little microcosm of the world you know and we have you know some of the dojos are you know are are really good um, kind of uh, illustrations of, of, of the good in the world. And some of them, maybe not so much. I've been around a long time. I've seen a few that maybe not so much, <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe they, they don't embody the, the, the good of the world. And the way things are now and the division and, and things that we have now, you know, at the end of the day, we can all still put on our little white gi and put on our little belt and we can all just go train. And it doesn't matter who you voted for or what color your skin is or what religion you are. We all just get together and we just do our thing. And none of those other things matter. Completely agree. I completely agree. So here, here we have one of those kind of rare episodes where we, where we start off and we just kind of roll. Mm. You good if we just roll? Oh, absolutely. Okay, yeah. cool. So then, <laughs> so then I, I, I do want to take it back a little bit. And, and you know, how did you get started? So... It's funny. I just, I wish I had a great story. I wish I got picked on and, and, you know, I got, I got bullied or something. And it's probably the only place anybody (laughs) says, I wish I'd gotten picked on. (laughs) You know, I wish I had a really cool story to tell you, but you know what? It was funny. I was, um, I was 15 and, um, uh, which I, you know, was, was actually turned out to be a pretty good age for me to start. Cause maybe if I started when I was three or four years old, maybe I might not have hung in there. Maybe, you know, something would have left a bad taste in my mouth and I would have switched, switched to a different pursuit or something. But 15 was a, it, it's a, it's kind of a rare age to start. Cause most 15 year old kids are thinking about girls and cars and, you know, you know, uh, you know, the homecoming and, and these, you know, these types of things in their, in their high school, in, in their regular life. And, you know, for, for some reason for me, uh, 15 seemed to be a, a great time to start. But anyway, I, I got a little job at a pizza place and I wasn't even really supposed to be working there because I, they didn't hire till 16. But, um, you know, I told them back then, you know, they didn't really check on anything and, you know, there wasn't any online, anything to go check on it. So when, you know, I went and applied for the job and he says, you're 16, right? I said, um, oh yeah, I'm 16. And he believed me, <laughs> you know, I mean, I was almost 16. I was like 15 and change, you know? Um, and, and I said, oh yeah, I'm 16. And, you know, so he hired me and I started working there and there was a kid there who was like the shift manager and he was into Kung Fu and he used to, would be cleaning up late at night. We'd be doing dishes we'd be doing this and that and cleaning up after the day. And, and he used to, um, he used to tell me these stories about his Kung Fu class and this, that, and the other. And looking back, I'm pretty sure most of the stories he told me were, um, you know, elaborate <laughs> fabrications and, 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 you know, uh, you know, taking some liberties on, on certain parts yeah. of what really happened yeah. um, to put it, to put it mildly. But 
I believed them. I was 15 years old and I knew zero. All I knew was, you know, Kung Fu from, from TV. And, you know, uh, we used to watch Kung Fu theater on Saturday mornings and all the old, the old Chinese Kung Fu movies. I didn't, I didn't know anything. So when he told me these things, I kind of believed them. So I, it was funny. I was, I it was a Friday afternoon and, um, my dad came home from work and, you know, changed his shirt. And he said, what, what are you doing? I said, Hey dad, you, you know, I'd like to get involved in some, some martial arts, some, some Kung Fu. Kung Fu, really? You know, at the time, I, you know, I played baseball, basketball, hockey up here in, in Massachusetts in the Northeast. If, you know, everybody played hockey, everybody played football, you know, that's what we did. And um, he says, really? He says, you know, where, well, where, where, where do you do that? I said, oh, well, there's a Kung Fu place, you know, next town over. Can we, can we go check it out? He said, yeah, let's go. So we hop in the car and we go down and, and he, uh, you know, we get down there and there was a class in the afternoon going on and um, it was a, it was like a, like a green jade kung fu or something, and uh, so we went in and we sat down, we watched, and the, the instructor came over, and um, you know introduced himself, and he, he talked to us, and he explained that you know it's going to be probably three or four months before you throw your first kick, and you'll just be over there in the corner, and we'll show you how to punch for a couple of months, and this, that, and the other, and he gave us some, you know a, 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 a flyer with a list of prices and such, and. And, uh, you know, we watched a few more minutes of the class and everybody was doing their thing. And, oh, that's pretty cool, you know. So we left. My dad says, no, what do you think? I said, uh, I don't know, Dad. Jeez, you know, three months? I'm going to stay in the corner and punch for three months? Like, you know, I didn't know. You know, I'm not really sure about that. I said, no, I don't know, you know. So we talk about it a little bit on the way home. And, yeah, okay. You know, we'll think about it. So uh, we're driving home and we're getting ready to drive right by our street. You know, we're getting up to the street and he says, well, what about the karate studio and the other in the, in, in, in next town over, you know, he says, what about, what about that place? And I said, oh, dad, you know, I'm, it's tired. I'm tired. It's Friday afternoon. Let's, we're driving right by the house. Let's just go home. He says, no, John, come on. Let's, let's, you know, let, let's go up and check the place. Oh, no, dad, I don't want to go. He says, just come on. I said, okay. So my, my dad drags me up there kicking and screaming. Okay. And who would have known, you know, 37 years later, here I am. But my dad drags me in, 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 up to the other place, kind of, you know, against my will. So, of course, we, we get there and we walk in and the door opens. And upstairs was like the, the dojo, like the workout area. But downstairs was like the boxing gym where all the bags, the ring, and and everything where and this guy, we walk in, the door shuts, and there's a guy in the ring, and he's, and he's holding focus mitts for another, you know, younger kid who's, who's hitting the targets. And he, the guy steps through the ring, he comes walking over, and he's this monstrous guy, and this little skinny 15 year old kid. And he comes over and he shakes my hand and he introduces himself. He says, Hi, I'm Billy Blanks. <laughs> and I said, Hi, Mr. Blanks, I'm John. My dad said, I'm John also, you know, I'm Junior. You know, so we, we walk into Billy Blanks's karate school over here in Massachusetts. And um, he talked to us for a few minutes, brought us upstairs. We, we watched a little bit of class. There were people up there and they were sparring and it was they were going at it pretty good as, as best I can remember. And we walked out of the place. My dad says, what do you think? I said, I don't know. What do you think? He goes, I think, son, if you're going to do karate, I think that's the guy you should be doing it with. <laughs> and, um, and that's how I met. How, how right he was. <laughs> and that's how I met Mr. Blanks, my first instructor. Wow. Yeah. Just walked into his dojo on a Friday afternoon one day. Random. You didn't, you didn't know who he was. Just random. Had no idea, you know, what, who, anything about him, what he was, you know, what he was going to become afterwards and, and everything else. And, yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of how I got started, and uh, yeah, so that was Friday. I went to class on Monday, and and off I went with uh, learning to be a tournament fighter and a boxer and a kickboxer with Mister Blanks. Wow, well, it's quite the education yeah. from <laughs> quite the person with with some heavy credentials. You know, I'm sure we've got some younger listeners like I, I don't I don't know this name, and and I'm going to encourage you not not to pause and go Google because you're probably going to end up with the wrong stuff. <laughs> yeah, if, so, if you just search, and that's unfortunate. It, it is uh, unfortunate. There's, you know, there's there's certain things out there, and you know, this was well before you know Mr. Blanks was known for Tybo. Right. This was, you know, I met the 28 year old Mr. Blanks, you know, who, you know, who basically was the best conditioned athlete I've ever seen, and was probably the best tournament fighter in the world at the time, yeah. um, and uh, you know. That's what we focused on. 
You know, that was, that was how, and I had no idea what a karate tournament was, never seen one, never heard of one, never was at all interested in, in getting involved in any, any martial arts events, any sport fighting of any kind. Um, but, you know, at that time, you know, if you were in, in Mr. Blanks school, you were a tournament fighter, you, you know, you were going to box and kickbox and, and tournament mm -hmm. fight. So that's kind of, um, you know, that's kind of how I got started. It's funny, I, you know, people ask me, you know, about, you know, how I got involved with what I'm doing now. And I said, you know, I kind of, I kind of had like a, like a two kind of tier martial arts life. One was kind of a career and one is kind of a journey. And my career, you know, came for the first, you know, 10 or 12 or 14 years of, of, of my training um, you know, with Mr. Blanks and, and starting off in karate tournaments and eventually making my way onto team Paul Mitchell. Um, and, you know, fortunately and luckily and, um, through God's good graces, uh, able to, you know, travel the world, the country and, and, and then the world, um, you know, representing the United States in competition. And, you know, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of the career aspect of it. And then, that when that kind of ended, you know, now I wanted to kind of go back to the roots and, and kind of figure out where all this came from and, and what am I doing? And I, and again, I had that kind of childhood dream of, of that most, I think, young, uh, martial artists, no matter what discipline you're involved in, um, <clears throat> I think everybody has this kind of this fantasy of going to the old country and training with one of the old masters with the, with the little long white beard and <laughs> you know what I mean and learning to speak the language and that's kind of I, I always had that kind of um, that kind of fantasy in my head and you know so um, you know I retired when I was thirty. It's funny I kind of promised my mom that you know I I wouldn't do this after age thirty and you know so I wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't have brain damage from getting hit in the head so much. And, um, you know, fortunately, I, I was able to, to reach most of my um, sport fighting goals by age 30. So it seemed like a good, good time to call it quits and, and kind of move on with um, away from the career part of my, of my martial arts life and on to the journey part of my martial arts life. So, let, so let's go back because, you know, we, we, got, we got a chunk. Mm. And anybody who's spent time in, in competition understands that, you know, that, that kind of cycle of, of passionate training, competition, and either the, the pride in success or the dedication, you know, kind of redoubling your efforts in, whether you call it defeat or, you know, not standing on top of the podium, so to speak, mm. you know, there's, a, there's some momentum there. And you get on that conveyor, and a, and a lot of us get on that conveyor, and we stick around for years. I mean, I was on it for for a couple of years. You were on it for much longer than I was. But there must have been something prior to that first competition that kept you around. You 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 weren't, you know, you as you said, you didn't join the school because you wanted to go to karate tournaments. You joined the school because you wanted to learn martial arts, and you didn't want to stand in the corner and punch at the kung fu school for three months. So something. Day one, day two, day three kept you coming back for that next class before you could even get on that mm. conveyor. And, and and I hope the term conveyor doesn't come across disparaging. That's not how I mean. I mean, it just can be a very focused uh, pattern of training. Mm. But prior to that focused pattern, there was there was something that kept you around. What was that? So uh, it's tough to say, but I think um, I was always involved in. Um, team sports because that's kind of all there was. Yeah. You know, you, if, if you lived in the Northeast, if you're from my area, from my neck of the woods up here, you played hockey. You know, that's what we did all winter. And in the fall, we played football. And in the spring, we played baseball. And in the summer, we did all of those things. You know, throughout the summer, depending on what we could, you know, um, you know, if we could, if we could get to the rink or if we could get to the ball field or whatever. But um, I think what really Looking back, I didn't know at the time, obviously, all of this is hindsight. Um, I didn't know at the time, but I think maybe the individuality of the whole thing is what kind of really kept me going. Like what I did, if I was successful, it was because of, of what I was doing, what I was thinking, what I was feeling. If I was unsuccessful, it was because of me. 
it didn't have to do with the team. I didn't have to share anything or, or share blame. I didn't have to share the accolades. I didn't have to share winning or losing. It was kind of just about me, you know, and if, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna have to work harder. And if I fail, I'm gonna go back and redouble my efforts and work harder. Like you said, you know, though, I think that's what really kind of drew me, um, to kind of the, the tournament thing, in addition to, you know, having one of the top fighters in the world as my teacher and all the other students, you know, beating the crap out of me on a, on a daily basis and not wanting that to continue, you know, wanting to improve my skills to the point that I wasn't getting beat up every minute. Sure. But um, I think it was, I think it was the fact that it was just me, you know, there was no team. It was just, just, just me. I got a chance to get in the ring with another person and do my thing and, you know, and and I think that's that's probably what kept me going in, in karate at, at the beginning before the before the the tournament career kind of took off. I think I think maybe just uh, you know the individuality of the whole thing. There there's a tone in what you're saying that suggests a really solid work ethic. Was that something that you had when you started training? Um, I think I did, but I had to cultivate it. I think a lot of, you know, if we, a lot of backtracking a little bit. I think a lot of, you know, parents, they, they want to bring their kids to a martial arts dojo because there's a lot that can be learned and a lot that can be instilled in young kids' minds and, you know, the, the goal setting of, of the belt system and, 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 the, and the hard work and the discipline and the, and the confidence and the focus and all of the things that, that martial arts provides for young people. Um, you know, I kind of started when I was 15 and then, you know, by the time I was 16, 17, you know, I think you know, most of those things are already um, fairly instilled or ingrained in you. But I think the martial arts training can cultivate those things. It's like, you know, you can, you know, you forge a sword and then you polish a sword. And it takes a lot longer to polish a sh sword than it does to forge the sword. And I think that's kind of what what it was with me. I think I had that kind of hard work ethic again back in the 80s, a long time ago. I'm, I'm uh, you know, aging myself a little bit here, but back in the eighties, you know, the old football coaches and hockey coaches, when I was coming up, they were hardcore guys. It wasn't like it is now, you know, things have changed a little bit back in the old school of, of a hockey team and a football team. I mean, you really worked hard and they instilled that discipline and that rugged determination and those types of things, you know, to make sure the team did well. So I think I had that in me, but I think, um, I think my martial arts training kind of cultivated it. I think the martial arts training kind of polished the sword, so to speak. That makes sense. I get it. Yeah. I get it. All right. Well, there's a difference between training at a competition focused school hmm. and joining the most, I, I, I think I can say this, the most prestigious martial arts competition team that has ever been those are along the same path but quite a distance from each other hmm. if you spend time in competition you know team paul mitchell and if you spend time in competition you have aspirations to to grow and move on that's it's probably the target hmm. so when did that enter your vision so um it was funny. I kind of got, got kind of thrown into the whole thing. Um, Mr. Blanks moved to California to pursue his next level and, and his dreams of, of moving on with his martial arts journey um, in the late 80s, 88 or 89. Um, and so, you know, it was at that time that I continued to train with him traveling back and forth to California. But um, you know, I was back here and he was out there and my family and my life was here. So, um, you know, there were different, a couple of um, different students that were either direct students of, of Mr. Blanks or, or um, kind of corollary students that had trained at other dojos that were, were doing things. So I was kind of training there and doing those, uh, you know, kind of bouncing around training. And then it, it kind of, uh, an opportunity arose that I could kind of take over a, a dojo that was, um, that was closing. 
So, you know, I was, I was 20 years old at the time and, um, you know, I wanted, I basically needed a place to train because I wanted to pursue that tournament career. And I was doing okay in my tournaments, my local events and such, but nothing, nothing on a, on a, on a national or international scale for sure. And, um, you know, so I opened up, it's funny, I opened up the karate studio, um, in September of 1990. And, um, I was at a, I was at a local event and I had been, been doing okay. And I've been, been, um, been fighting with a, you know, I'd, I'd fight the Paul Mitchell guys from time to time. If I made it up through the, you know, up to the finals or the semifinals, I'd, I'd get to fight a few, you know, a few of the Paul Mitchell guys here and there. And I was doing okay. And I was, you know, starting to kind of develop a, a little bit of a, a regional, uh, <clears throat> kind of reputation of, you know, just working hard and being a pretty good fighter. And, um, you know, right around the same time that I opened, um, my, my karate studio, um, you know, I got the coach of team Paul Mitchell, Mr. Rodriguez came over after one of the tournaments. It's funny. I, I didn't even win. I actually lost. I lost to the, uh, to the captain of team Paul Mitchell. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't even win the match <laughs> and he came over and, uh, and he'd ask if, if I'd like to come down and, and train with the guys down in Rhode Island and, um, and see about joining the team. And I mean, that was just, that was it. That was the day. That was the day the dream came true. Mm. And, um, yeah, I think, I think maybe I just, I, I stuck around long enough and, 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 and made enough of an impression that they figured to take a shot with me. Um, and I, I thought, you know, it's no way I can, I can do this. I didn't, I didn't deserve this, but you know, they gave me a shot and I just, you know, I just made it, made it my goal to, to live up to it. You know, and I think that happens a lot in, in martial arts. I think maybe sometimes you feel like maybe you didn't, you didn't deserve it or you didn't earn it, but, it's more of I'm going to kind of live up to that, and I think that's I think that's kind of how I felt when Paul Mitchell kind of a, when the Paul Mitchell people kind of approached me. I, you know, I want to try to live up to this, and again, it goes right back to what you said earlier. I redoubled my efforts and just decided that you know now I have to start really training hard, and um, yeah. that's it. But you, if I'm doing my math right, you were really young. I was 20. Yeah, with a school. Yeah. And being I, on a team. Yeah. I, I was, um, it was right around, I, I, I spoke to, I opened up the school in September of 1990. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I turned 21 in December. Yeah. So what, was, did, what did your parents think of that? Um, <laughs> it was funny. They, you know, I mean, open, having a business and, and, and that whole thing, the good news was, is that it was kind of turnkey just because it was another school that was closing. And, um, I was, I was friends with the gentleman that, that, um, was closing his school and, you know, I, it made it real easy for me to just talk to the landlord, you know, have, have the, the lease changed into my name. Like we kept the phone number. I bought all the equipment from them. You know what I mean? So he moved out, I moved in and, and off we went. So it was, it was a, it was a good opportunity. Um, if we had to go from scratch and I needed, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to get the business up and running, it probably wouldn't have happened because my mom and dad probably would have talked me out of taking out those loans, <laughs> you know, but, um, it was a, it was a really, really good opportunity and I was very fortunate to have it. So, um, they were actually pretty supportive of the whole thing. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And so, yeah. What did the next few years look like? Did, did you have a full-time job or a, a um, day job? Yeah, I did at the time. And um, I tried to do both. <laughs> I, tried to, I tried to teach karate full-time and work a, a full-time job, and it really didn't work out. So it's funny. I moved. Um, you know, I made a deal with my mom and dad. And, you know, any, any chance I could, you know, move back into the house for a while and uh, <laughs> see if I can make a go of it with the karate studio. And, of course, my mom and dad were happy to help. Um, wonderful people. So... Um, yeah, I moved back home. <laughs> that's, that's how I funded the karate studio for the first couple of years. You're not the first. You won't be the last. <laughs> I, I, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, you know, 20 to 30, 10 years of, of being on that team, which, you know, from my knowledge of that team means you were competing frequently. And as you said, across the globe. Yeah. It was, I'm going to guess, if not the top priority on your list, number two? Um, it was number one, and nothing okay. was even remotely right. close as second. Okay. 
to be so, perfectly honest. <laughs> yeah. So, so tell me about your training and what that looked like. Let's start there. So, um, fortunately, um, a lot of the guys on Team Paul Mitchell were local from the New England. It started off as a very local kind of team. Team Paul Mitchell wasn't this international team with, you know, fighters from, from Europe and places like that on the team. It started off as a, as a New England kind of base team. And there were, you know, eight or 10 people and they were from Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts and, you know, places up, up here in the Northeast. So it started off small and it kind of obviously grew into what it is now. But, um, I was fortunate to have, you know, world champion, national champion, very, very good people that I could get in my car and drive to and go spar at their dojo, you know, and, and train with these people, you know, Pedro Xavier and, and Chris Rappold and, and the, all the guys from Boston Taekwondo, um, you know, guys like that. I mean, we had access to all that. We could get together all the time and train. So, um, you know, that there was no shortage of, of really good training for me. And I was very fortunate to have that. So that's, um, you know, we basically we did one of uh, one of the things that I learned. Um, one of the many, many things, one of the most important things I think I learned from Mr. Blanks was how to train alone, how to train by myself. I didn't need a sparring partner, um, you know, at the time, you know, sparring a couple times a week, but to just be able to drill and train until you know you're almost ready to pass out alone in a room um i think that was a that was a big part of of what i did and i don't think everybody can do that i think that has to that has to kind of come from within and i think you know it has to be you know kind of has to be taught you know that it's doable you know you don't always need a training party you can do this by yourself and again we kind of circle back to the individuality of the whole thing mm -hmm. and i think that you know, that really um, helped me as far as my, um, you know, my sport fighting career went. Um, just being able to to go to the dojo at, at you know, 10 o'clock on a Friday night and train for two hours by myself. I think that really made a big difference. In addition to obviously all the awesome sparring partners I had. Sure. You know, beast. Yeah. Sure. You know, the, the time that you were on the team was the time that I was just getting started as a competitor. Right. You know, so, so all those names you're dropping, those are names that I was looking up to yeah. back then going, wow, yeah, maybe one day. Yeah, me too. I was <laughs> like that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was really like that too. It was really a dream come true for me. Sure. You know. So what about the travel? Had you done much traveling prior to being on the team? Whatever I could afford. Um, I'd drive to, you know, there'd be a big event in Boston, big event in Rhode Island, big event in New York. You know, and so I'd do three or four of the of the national tournaments I could just drive to. And then, you know, once or twice a year, I'd jump on a plane and fly down to Florida for the U.S. Open or, or something like that. And just do what I could, pay in my own way and, and just whatever I could afford, which wasn't a lot at the time. And then, um, you know, obviously, once once we got once I got on the team, um, you know, they, they picked up the bill for that. So obviously, you know, we were traveling you know, 12 to 15 national events a year. And we were in and out of the country, you know, five or six times a year, some years, and you know, um, yeah, like you said earlier, just a really pretty, um, pretty busy schedule as far as travel goes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Think about those early days. Any, any fun stories that came out of <laughs> international travel as a, you know, a young kid from, from the Northeast? Yeah, I mean, I just, you know what? It's funny. I, 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 I tell my own kids now when we, when we come along, any, any kind of experience that I think they need to, to pause and, and, and take stock of and, 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 and try and make sure that they understand the gravity and, and the importance of whatever it is. Um, you know, I wish that I kind of stopped and smelled the flowers a little more. Um, you know, I, you know, would go to, would go to Italy, would go to, would go to France or would go to Germany. And, you know, I'd be so super hyper focused on my, you know, on, on my fight that, you know, would, would go, you know, would go sightseeing and I, <laughs> and I wouldn't enjoy it as much. I wouldn't, I, you know, I, my mind was somewhere else, you know, when I should have been enjoying, 
enjoying all the travel. And it's almost, it's funny to say, well, you know, you were young. Yeah. But it was in a way I was almost too young to really appreciate, um, all the different countries I got, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to go to and all the different, you know, cities here in America that I have, that I had the opportunity to go to. I think maybe I, um, I missed out a little bit. I think looking back now, I would have stopped and, and smelled the flowers a little bit more. That's for sure. But maybe you wouldn't have been as successful if you were built that way. Uh, again, a hundred percent accurate. Um, I was just so hyper focused on that, and maybe, maybe uh, I'd like to think I I could have done both. But I think you're probably right. The way the way my mind works and the way I'm built, probably not. Yeah. I think that's safe to say. Yeah. So that ten years on the team, there's there's I, I would imagine there were some let's call them transitional points, points where yeah. you can look back and say, ah, this brought me to the next level or Mm. you know this match was something i I reflect on often you know Mm. any any points like that lines in the sand you can point to i I absolutely do and i think i think most most athletes that you know have competed at a high level no matter what they do are going to have are going to have kind of like you said a transition point or a turning point or something that changed something that clicked um People talk about, oh, well, after this, it started to click for me. And um, so there was a, a, a fighter back in the, the 80s and 90s called Mafia Holloway. I'm sure you recognize the name. I certainly do. Um, also from Boston. <laughs> um, one of the best middleweight fighters that ever lived. Um, just a, a super, super fighter. He was on, you know, Trans World Oil um, team before, you know, before. Uh, you know, before Team Paul Mitchell really kind of, kind of moved to the national international stage, um, the Trans World Oil team was the was the best karate team in the world. Um, so Mafia and I were kind of, um, you know, we were kind of rivals. We were fighting in the same divisions. We were competing in the same events all the time. It was usually me and him. You know, when it came down to it for for the final match, you know, more often than not, it, it was him and I that had to that had to figure out who was going to be first and who was going to be second. And um, it was funny. I, I lost. I lost in a tournament in maybe like the second round to a you know a fighter who was a good fighter. Not, not nobody famous. Not, not not a top top competitor. But I lost my match. And then we went to the next tournament. I, I lost another match. Again, same deal. Good fighter, but not not that upper echelon kind of fighter. Not somebody that that anybody watching would have expected. No, an, we could call it an upset. It, it, definitely an upset. Um, and it's funny, and Mafia and I, being the rivals that we were, we were still reasonably good friends. He comes over, he sits down next to me, and he says, um, what's going on? He says, you know, of course, and of course he went on to win it without much of a problem. So it was, I, I gifted him two nice, easy tournament wins that <laughs> in a row. And um, <clears throat> he says, what's going on? I said, you know, I don't know, man. He says, you know, this is supposed to be, you know, this, this, this stuff is supposed to be you and I up there every one of these you know what's happening what's going on i said i'm not really sure you know and i said uh oh, you know i haven't i haven't quite put my finger on it and he says what kind of um what kind of training do you do that are you doing are you doing this are you doing that and i says you know i kind of told him what i was working on he says you know do you go into the gym you know you own your own, own dojo right i said oh yeah and he says do you go into the gym at night by yourself I said, well, yeah, I train alone a lot. No. He says, no. Do you go into the gym at night, like late at night, all by yourself? And I said, not really. And he says, think about it. Something to think about. You know, get in there, do it all by yourself. And I said, okay. So I, I wasn't really sure exactly what it meant. It felt, it sounded, it felt kind of cryptic to me. So I started getting to the gym on Friday night, on Saturday night, and I started training at like midnight, all by myself, you know, middle of the night, everybody else is asleep, you know, driving back and forth to the gym, roads all by myself. And I started training really late at night all by myself. And what happened was it it, it got me back to my roots. It started, I think maybe that I got away from that a little bit. And it kind of got me back into my own head because I was by myself. It was it was freezing cold in the dojo, and I was there at one o'clock in the morning while whoever I was fighting was was sound asleep. I wasn't sleeping; I was training, and that's kind of what I needed 
to get me back focused, to get me back where I needed to be. I needed to know that I was training when my opponent was sleeping. And and it 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 the next tournament, you know, came right back, won the next event, won the next event after that, won the next event after that. You know, I went on this three or four tournament, you know, run and um and actually beat Mafia, you know, along the way a couple of times. And um it was it was an absolute turning point in in how I trained and how I approached it, how I approached the training, how I approached the tournament. And um and that was one of the things that one of my fiercest rivals, my fiercest opponents, gifted me that day that he just came over and sat down next to me and asked me what was going on. You know, it's really he wanted you to get better. So yeah. you would have to get better. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, he just, you know, he gifted me, you know, that that one little nugget that he thought would help, and out of all the people I thought would help me, it would never be him. Mm-hmm. And what he said, you know, made an absolute difference in how I approached everything from that point forward. So you said you said that when he gave you that advice, you weren't quite sure what he meant. Mm-hmm. So obviously, you 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 tried it, mm-hmm. you figured it out, and it worked. Mm-hmm. So what, what would you call it? Is it remembering where you came from? Was it that you got, you know, kind of too high on yourself because you were out there and you were successful and you, you weren't training with as much intensity as you had when you started, you know, what, what was it that that gift opened up for you? Well, I think a a, a bunch of, of, I think all of what you said to a degree and as best as I can figure out, you know, looking back, it was, it was more just making it less about anything else or anybody else or whatever gi I was wearing, whoever's name was on my gi. And I got back into, into my own head. I got back into concentrating on me and not necessarily, um, what other, other kind of external things whatever they may be, whether it was trying to run a full-time dojo or trying to live up to the Team Paul Mitchell logo on my back or whatever it may be, it just became about me, you know, and it kind of brought me back to that original kind of reason for for, for training and sticking with it, you know, and I think it, it absolutely probably saved my tournament career. When I asked the question about transition points and milestones, it sounded like there might be more than one. Was there was there another one you wanted to talk about? Well, I, I think I think depending on on the time, um, the the level of importance maybe at the time mm-hmm. seemed bigger than it was looking back for 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 different things. But I think um, you know, obviously, you know, having having been asked to to, to join Team Paul Mitchell was a huge turning point that brought me from just being able to drive my, you know, my crappy beat up car to a few tournaments locally, you know, to being able to get on a plane and fly to Europe and fight, obviously a huge turning point. Um, and, you know, um, before, going back before that, you know, Mr. Blank's moving to moving to California and have, you know, me kind of having to figure it out back here um, with a couple of close friends you know, that was a big turning point. And then, you know, my story with, uh, with mafia, that was, that, that was a pretty big turning point. Um, you know, and I think one of, um, moving on to kind of the next kind of phase of, of my martial arts life. Um, I started training after, you know, I couldn't really make it back and forth to California enough to just, to just train with, with Mr. Blanks all the time. And he was moving on with different things in his career. He was doing other stuff. He was making movies and he was um, developing Taibo and, and these types of things. Um, you know, I had my own thing going on back here. So I started training um, with Professor Nick Serial. And um, he's kind of, you know, uh, he's just a local legend up here in, in the island. And, and he's just, he was the top guy's 10th degree black belt and his resume just off the charts. All the, all the different people he trained under his level of, of expertise is just, you know, unbelievable. So I had an opportunity. I met him through, through tournaments and, and everything. He ran a tournament every year and he was always a, you know, head referee and guest, 
you know, guest instructor and guest personality at most of the big events up here in the Northeast. So I was training with Professor Serio, and unfortunately, um, he passed away very kind of unexpectedly um, of cancer. So that was kind of a, a big transition into kind of the next phase of my training. And um, it was right around the time that I was, I was finishing up my, my tournament career and I was getting ready coming up on that 30th birthday. And, um, you know, I had to find, um, you know, I had to go to plan C, you know, Mr. Blanks was plan A and Professor Syria was plan B and I didn't really have a plan C, but I did, I did have a friend, um, <clears throat> up here in Rhode Island who was on team Paul Mitchell for a while, kind of, uh, before I was, um, his name was Teach Luzzy. And I knew that he, um, you know, he traveled back and forth to Okinawa, and he was part of a very traditional or classical um, Shonen Ryu system. Uh, so I, I talked to him, and that kind of brought me to where I wanted to be. As far as you know, what I wanna, I wanna go back to the to the beginning, and I don't mean to the beginning of my tournament career, to the beginning of of my karate here. I mean the beginning of of karate in general you know, traditional Okinawan karate. I wanted to figure out what that was all about. So um, I got involved with um, with Cheech, and, you know, uh, through him I met, you know, two or three unbelievable instructors here in America. And, you know, before I knew it, I was on a plane to, to Okinawa to, to kind of fulfill that childhood dream of, of going to the old country and training with the master. There's a theme that's coming up as you're talking about your your life as as a martial artist, and and that is one of kind of we could call it travel, but I'm going to term it seeking. Mm. You know, you were you sought out martial arts. You continue to seek out Mr. Blanks. You sought out what you could get from competition. Sought out Professor Serio. Sought out this other gentleman and traveling and just. This is not the typical story. We, we we talked when you first came on the call, how much we have in common. This piece right here, this is not something that most people have in common with you. What was it about martial arts or, or you know, maybe the loss of your first two instructors that had you hunting in this way? Because most people are, when they're confronted with those life events are going to do one of two things they're going to stop training or they, they're going to say who is the best i have available to me within a reasonable reasonable travel mm. distance mm. i think i just always felt like from day one that there was just always going to be more i was like this optimist i was optimistic that there was more to this you know that there's got to be there's got to be something more and with 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 tournament fighting and, and just sport fighting, um, I think, you know, I, I, towards the end, you know, when I was, I was finishing up, I just felt like there's more, there's got, there, there's got to be more to this. And I just, I just want to find out what it is, you know? And I think going back, you know, that childhood dream of, 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 I think all martial artists, of, you know, going to whatever, country their their art of origin is and 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 finding finding the roots and finding a master who trained under a master who trained under the founder of the system and in that lineage and 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 trying to just find that truth you know because as you know you know living here in america there was a lot of untruth with martial arts here there is a lot of um you know snake oil sales and and such here in america that you know that, that you i think you feel like this you, you want to find you want to find the truth and i feel like maybe the truth is where it all started where the origins are and then you can you know kind of work from there if you can get back to the to the beginning to the origins then you can work forward and then you can kind of work it out for yourself what's the truth and what is it you know and i think that's what kind of motivated me after my tournament career so it was a hunch 
<laughs> right? Maybe, if, yes. If, if you believed yes. there was truth, but you didn't know what it was yet. No, yeah, 100%. It was, it was a hunch. I had a hunch. You know, I had a hunch. But I will say, I had a hunch with, I had a good educated hunch. Mm. Because <laughs> never really thought of it as, as an educated hunch, but it was absolutely an educated hunch because I did have access to a couple of people. There's a, um, a gentleman in North Carolina, um, Vietnam veteran who, you know, has been training for, you know, 60 something years. And, you know, I felt like he knew the truth. And he, you know, he was, he spent a lot of time in Okinawa with the masters back in the 60s and 70s. And then I had um, a gentleman, another mentor of mine in California, who just, when, when I watched him move and, and when he spoke and when he, when he explained things, I said, oh, man, I want to know what he knows. You know, how does he know? How does he know all that? Where did this come from? You know, and so I knew there was a hunch, but I was pretty sure there was more to it because I knew these two guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So if they know it, okay, maybe I can I can figure it out too. But I also knew where both of them came from. And both of them, the one thing they had in common was they were in Okinawa and they spent a lot of time there with the masters. So I figured on a hunch, I figured that was a good place for me to start. And and I hope you don't take that word as as not at all because I, I I don't mean it that way. What what you know I'm constantly reminded of um, this this statement, this very succinct statement that has come up for me constantly in my martial arts growth. My when, when I think back to my original school, there was a gentleman who earned his black belt when I was probably seven or eight, and I remember going up to congratulate him with my mother. And she asked him, what does it feel like to have a black belt? He said, you realize how much you don't know. Hmm. And I'm, I'm hearing in different words, but I'm hearing that from you now. Yeah. Yeah. That... You knew enough to know how much you didn't know. And I think that's important. You know, when you don't know what you don't know, that's not good. That's a recipe for stagnation. <laughs> oh. You know, you're going to quit. You're going to stop. You're going to find something else to do. Okay. The good news was, and I think it's probably like this for, for most martial artists, or I would hope, is that they have access to someone that, you know, has that kind of knowledge. So you know it can be attained, that you know that this person just knows more than you and you want to know what they know. You know, it would be a shame if, you know, you learn everything, you know, you you think you've learned everything your teacher knows, and then you go ahead and quit because there's nothing else beyond that. You know, they say a, a dojo needs three things. It needs students, it needs a teacher, and it needs the teacher's teacher, you know. And I think I was very fortunate to, you know, I was I was the teacher, but there was always the teacher's teacher. I always had people that knew a lot more than I did, <laughs> you know, and... I was fortunate to have that because maybe not everybody does. I agree. Mm. So what was that first trip to Okinawa like? So it's funny. Um, gentleman by the name of Pat Haley, um, unbelievable martial artist. He owns a dojo out in, in Chico, California. And um, he was just, when I watched that man move and I watched and I, I started to get what, what he was doing and, and the things he would say and, and the way he would say them and his depth of knowledge just really inspired me. And um, I just approached him one day and said, you know, hey, next time I knew he took, you know, brought students to Okinawa. Um, I said, you know, would it, would it be okay if I, if I tagged along? Next time, of course, John, no problem. Um, you know, next, next year when we go, you, you know, you're more than welcome to come. And, and, I, and I went with him that first time. And, you know, it's like, you know, Anybody that's been there, I'm sure a lot of listeners have, have been there. Um, anybody that's been there, when you when you first go the first time, just you know, breathing the air and putting your feet on the ground and eating the food and walking around and, and of course being in the in a dojo with with an Okinawan master um, for the first time, it's like you know, you that's it. You know, you know, you know, you've arrived, and it's just something that's you know kind of unexplainable. And I think some people maybe 
not so much. Maybe they took it for granted, and other people, it, it's it's kind of one of those those transitional moments, those those martial arts life changing events. And for me, it absolutely was. So when I was there again, what it did, it reminded me that I don't know anything, and I need to be here, like long term, like. The, the week and a half or, or whatever, how long we were there. And we did a lot of other stuff. We trained every night, but we also, you know, we went here, we went there and we did all the touristy things. Um, took a lot of pictures and bought a lot of, bought a lot of junk. And, you know, we, we just did that. And um, I realized, you know what? I, I, I need to be here. Like I need to be here longer than a week to, to, to figure this out. So on a hunch, I love that word now. So on a hunch, you know, um, you know, I, I figured I better, I better talk to, to Sensei and see if I can, see if I can figure out a way to stay here kind of long term. So, um, we got back, we got back to the States and I said, you know, called up, um, Sensei Haley and said, you know, what can I do to, to go, to go stay there? I know you were there and you, you were there long term and my other instructor here in America, um, Perry Sensei, he, you know, he lived there obviously. Um, he was stationed there during Vietnam, and, and he spent a lot of time there in the '60s and '70s. You know, how can I do that? You know, I don't, I don't have any connections. I don't have anything like that. So he said, "Let me look into it." So um, the the grandmaster of the system, one of his students, um, who was a ninth don at the time, um, had a dojo not too far from the grandmaster's dojo where we trained on my first trip, and uh, we had gone over there and we met him, and he took us out to took us out to dinner and, and was really, you know, his hospitality, you know, was, was fantastic. And he took care of all of us while we were there. And he, and, uh, since Haley said, I, you know, I'm going to talk to somebody there and maybe you can go stay with, uh, stay with Gibo sensei and you can stay there for, for a while, you know, more long term, you know, and like six months passed and, you know, I got a, I got an email from, uh, Gibo Sensei's top student who spoke pretty good English at the time. I spoke not a single word of Japanese. Hello and goodbye was the extent of it at the time. And, um, and he told me that, you know, he spoke with Gibo Sensei and it was acceptable that I come and stay and, um, you know, gave me the, some contact information and we started emailing back and forth and we organized the time. And, you know, four or five months after that, um, I was on a plane to, to go stay with Gibo Sensei and, and stay there long term and train. And that's kind of how I got introduced to the whole thing. Wow. And what was that experience like? I mean, it, it, your description, <sighs> the only word that's coming to mind for me is magical. It was magical. Um, again, it was it was kind of like a, a martial arts movie kind of, you know, opportunity kind of coming coming true. And, and you see stories like this. I mean, I'm not the first person to do this. And, you know, people have come before me that have gone and, and trained in, in Japan and Okinawa and China and stayed with their master and lived in the dojo or lived in the house or, you know, um, became an Uchi Deshi, uh, uh, Uchi's house Deshi student, uh, a kind of a, you know, someone that lives with the master would be considered an Uchi Deshi. Um, you know, there's been a lot of that before me. I certainly did not didn't invent this by any means, but um, it was, you know, getting off that plane for the first time and, and going to meet Gibo Sensei, who didn't remember me at all because I was part of a group of, you know, 15 or 20 people, you know, a year and a half or, you know, before that, you know, so obviously he didn't remember me. He spoke zero English and I spoke zero Japanese. So, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of communication sure. happening. Um, fortunately, um, my good friend um, Yagi Sensei spoke uh, really good English, and he and he could could email and, and everything, and he kind of organized everything for me. And um, you know, it was just uh, getting getting to the dojo, and 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 just being there and, and and living there on my own, all by myself. I've been away from home, you know, a thousand times, but not in another country, not by myself, and not for weeks and months at a time. So it was, um, I just decided that I'm going to do the best I can and embrace this and uh, try to learn the language and try to understand the culture and, and just learn as much from, from everybody there as I possibly could. And that's kind of, um, you know, that's kind of where, where it all started. How long were you there? Um, the first time I was there for like just over three months. 
So it was a it was a long enough time that um, that you know I was living there. I wasn't just visiting, but it was also a short enough time that I could you know that I could get home and, and continue to you know deal with everything that you know my responsibilities and things I had at home. So it was um, it was it was perfect timing actually, uh, long enough for me to cultivate some very very close friendships. Um, I learned a ton, but by no means did I learn, you know, at all. So, um, obviously it was a starting point of, of a relationship with, with Gibo Sensei and his students that, um, you know, just completely changed everything. And my focus went from, it was just, you know, it was kind of that, at that point I realized that I'm, you know, I'm not a tournament fighter. The goal was not to win my next match and, you know, and those types of things that this was, I, I'm here to seek the truth. And, and so that the career part of, of my martial arts life train, you know, changed to the journey part of my martial arts life. You know, I think it was that three months that, that kind of solidified that. Yeah. So- so you said everything changed. So when you came back to the States after three months, how did those changes manifest? Well, I had a lot more to offer my students as far as, you know, training and things like that. Um, you know, just physical, physical stuff. But for me, kind of personally and kind of emotionally, um, I was always... Even when I was, you know, even when I, when I was young, when I was 21 or 22 or 23 years old, I was always the teacher. I was running my own commercial dojo, trying to make a go of that, um, you know, trying to make sure I'm training for my next fight, and winning my events. Um, so I, it was, you know, I wasn't really a karate student during, you know, my years of, you know, my competition years. Um, I was a student for a while and then I opened, opened the dojo and, and became a member of team Paul Mitchell. And, you know, so I was, I was a fighter and I was a teacher. I wasn't a student. Um, that, that part was, was missing. When I came home, um, after that three months, I was a student. I was no longer a a fighter and I was no longer a teacher. I was going to continue to teach. Um, and offer my students whatever I could offer them, but I wasn't sensei. I, I was a student. And I think that is probably the biggest change that happened with me when I came home. Was that difficult? Um, no. No. And you wouldn't think you mess with be. your identity. No. Or anything you, like you know what? You would think it would be. And that I've I've had that question kind of posed to me. Um, in different ways over the years. And I have to say, and I've given it a lot of thought, and it actually wasn't. It was really easy, like super easy, because I knew what I wanted. I was focused on it, and I knew I wanted to be a student. And I hadn't been in a long time, and I missed it. It was something that I missed that was really, really important to me. So, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't difficult at all. So we've kind of got these, I don't know, we can probably call them two chapters, two martial arts chapters. It's mm-hmm. almost, you know, 30 and, you know, your 20s, younger, you know, getting started as a martial artist competition. And then the other side, this this realization that, that you wanted more or, or at least different. And, mm-hmm. and I, I would call it more. I think it's more. And you, You've been on that path, if I'm doing the math right, for for a while, a little while, Mm -hmm. and it sounds like you are just as passionate about it now as you were, maybe more so. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes, what's next? Are there are there goals? Is there is there more that you're hunting for? Um. So I. Over the years, traveling back and forth to to Okinawa and um, training with my mentors here in America, who still to this day, you know, we've, we've fast forwarded twenty what four years later, 
from, you know, I, I started, I kind of started um, uh, shoulder and view training in 1997. So 24 years later, um, you know, I realized that I still don't know anywhere near as much as those guys. <laughs> and I have, I have so much more to learn from them. And I try to get my hands on them and train with them as often as I can. One being on the, on the West coast and one being in North Carolina, it's difficult, especially during these times. Haven't seen anybody in a year or so. Um, but I, I just, I, I think it goes back to that and it just, it does, it just sounds cliche, but I just, the more, the more I know, the more I realize how much I don't know. And I'm still, I'm still, and it, it's, it's, I, I think this is where it, where it really, this is where kind of the rubber meets the road. I'm still that student um, trying to find the truth and, and trying to seek the truth um, that I was in, you know, early 2000s when I, when I went to Okinawa for the first time. Um, it, I'm not sure if I have something else that I want to kind of transition into another chapter of my life. I think that I just really want to keep trying to understand this chapter because again, it's cliche, but you know, it takes a lifetime to learn this. And, and the one thing I have learned is that is absolutely true. As corny as it sounds, you know, it is absolutely true. What, what that black belt said to your mom, you know, how does it feel to have a black belt? Well, you just realize how much you don't know. I'm still at that point. You know, I'm still at that point where I, I, I know how much I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's funny. You have to be okay with it. You know, it's not for everybody. No. You know, knowing that you're really not all, you've been doing it for 35, 30, what, 5, 37 years, 36 years now, you know, yeah. You, you you realize that you know you you really don't know all that much that's not easy for everybody us martial artists you you know anybody that's been doing this for a long period of time you're kind of crazy because you you really you, you spend all this time and you put in all this hard work and you realize man I really don't know any of this stuff I have a lot to learn and you have to be the right kind of person to be okay with that you know, and I think that's what kind of binds all of us. We're all that that crazy person that, that doesn't mind, you know, <laughs> not knowing what we really what we spend our life working on, not being all that good at it. Right. Imagine any other industry or pursuit or hobby, and say, you know, I've been at it for thirty seven years, and you know, I just keep finding all this stuff that I don't know. I, I just I don't. I've never heard that discussed about anything else besides martial arts. Yeah, me too. And it's funny, it, you have to be the right kind of person for it. It's not for everybody. I mean, I don't have to tell you. I mean, I, imagine if, uh, you know, we all had every student that signed up at our dojo was still a student at our dojo. You know, would all have 10,000 students. Right. <laughs> you know, um, it's not for everybody. But um, if, if you give it a chance, I think it, it could be for everybody. But I think this kind of that that journey of, of of seeking that truth and just always always moving forward and always trying to find that next level and having people that are at that next level or beyond that next level to kind of motivate you to keep working, you know, if you have that, I think it's it, it could be for everybody. Sure, sure. Hmm. If, if people want to find you online, you know, website, social media, anything like that, you can share. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm a little bit of a dinosaur when it comes to the social media. I don't have a, a Facebook page or anything like that. Um, but uh, the students have, um, my students have a, a, a Facebook for, for our organization in Okinawa, uh, my instructor's organization. It's the American Shobukan um, on Facebook. And um, anybody that would want to contact me, they could, they could just email me directly. My email is johnpayton one at comcast.net j-o-h-n-p-a-y-t-o-n the number one at comcast.net um easy yeah enough. any anybody yeah easy enough to find me and you can email me um 
you know, and you can you can see um, a little bit about our organization in Okinawa, uh, the American Shobu Khan, S H O B U K A N, um, and that's on on our Facebook. It's on my personal Facebook. Uh, my students kind of kind of run no, out. I, I don't even know how to get on the thing to be honest with you. Just hey, you know what? Uh, <laughs> social media certainly has value, but it is not. Yeah. It is not without its drawbacks. Yeah, yeah. But my students do a good job with it, so um, yeah, uh, easy enough to find if anybody's interested in uh, in talking about anything. I, I that's the thing. I just love to talk like this. I love to hear other it shows stories. It I love some great the, stories and stuff. Yeah, I love uh, I love listening to the podcast, listening to yeah. everybody else's story because I always find something that just brings it all right around to to my journey as well. Like mm-hmm. you said at the very beginning, I think before we even started recording that we have to, there's a lot more commonality than than difference in all in, in everything we do and all of our stories. And I think that's absolutely true. Totally. All right. Well we're 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 about to roll out to the outro, but I always like to give the guests the final words. So what are your final words for the people listening? <laughs> oh man, you put me on the spot. I'm not sure if I have anything super pro. Oh, come on, you've been on the spot for the over day. an hour. Yeah. You've been killing it. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't. I'm sure I don't have anything super profound to uh, to share with anybody. But if if anything, just um, for me, what what worked for me was just you know, kind of having that that proverbial empty cup, just always being able to you know find somebody and just learn from 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 somebody from anybody always having that um you know that that student mindset so we can always you know we can always learn and making sure that cup is empty so we're not you know these external things aren't aren't blocking our our learning they're not they're not stunting our growth you know just making sure that we can uh you know we can keep that child's mind and and move forward and, and keep growing because no matter how long you live, no matter how many years you're involved in this, you will continue to learn. You just have to have the right mindset. You know, it's always fun to talk to other martial artists. I get to compare notes and learn from them. But on today's episode, I got to talk to someone who I've known about for a long time. I don't know if you picked up on it. It was probably about a third of the way into the episode where some things clicked in for me and I went, ah, that's right. I remember this guy from back in the day. I remember him from competing. I remember his name. I remember seeing him in tournament rankings and saying, aha, that's somebody who's putting in the time and really doing it. And to be able to talk to him today and to hear those, those stories, those origins, but more importantly to me now, what that all led to, to know that there are others, and I, I knew before, but to have it reaffirmed that there are others who are constantly searching for more and better, and the desire to improve is just so powerful to me, and I hope you took something from it as well. So, Sensei, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for your time. Thanks for sharing those great stories, and hopefully we can connect in person at some point in the near future. To those of you listening, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out those show notes. Check out the photos that we put there. Check out the transcripts, all that good stuff. We recently updated the website. Complete overhaul. If you've got feedback on how we can further improve it, let us know. You can email me for this or any other reason. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. And if you want to support what we're doing here at Whistlekick, remember, we've got a store at whistlekick.com. We've got the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick sharing episodes, reviews, all that good stuff, please. The more you help us, the more we're able to do and bring you and support you as a traditional martial artist. If you see somebody out there rocking some whistle kick gear, say hello. And if you've got guest feedback, suggestions, any of that good stuff, hit me up, Jeremy, at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.